Good day, folks. It's so good to be here with you uh, on this day. And tomorrow uh, is the 24th of March. Uh, and on the Christian calendar, that is Palm Sunday. So I hope and pray that you'll be able to go to uh, a service and, and take part on this annual remembrance of Jesus' uh, resurrection. And uh, thank you so much for having me in your places. I probably just said that. And today we're going to continue to look at uh, in the Gospels and focus our attention uh, as we prepare for Good Friday and Easter Sunday for those, uh, uh, those moments in our lives uh, as we think, and think about Jesus and all he's done for us on the cross. Well, according to Grammarly.com, Quote, an idiom is a phrase. When taken as a whole has a meaning you wouldn't be able to deduce from the meanings of the individual words. For example, to kill two birds with one stone. Now, those of us where our first language is English, we know this does not mean that birds were killed or that stones were thrown. It means that someone completed two tasks or one. Two tasks at once. Another common idiom would be uh, a piece of cake. And for you cake lovers out there, I know you love your cakes, but there's no cake involved here. This simply means the task was easily done. Or how about someone who is cool as a cucumber? Cool as a cucumber. This is someone who is calm and relaxed. And there are those of us who enjoy 40 winks once in a while. And maybe this is something that we do on a Sunday afternoon. We have a little nap after church. 40 winks. But one last example for us is the idiom to play with fire. And this one means, uh, according to Grammar Lee, quote, to take actions or make decisions that have a high probability of causing negative or harmful effects. This is a cautionary phrase. It has a cautionary nature. It's describing someone who may not be aware or is totally disregarding the potential dangers of their decisions or their actions they will be taking. A synonym for uh, to play with fire could be walking on thin ice. Now you might be saying, Great grammar lesson, Pastor, but I didn't come here to brush up on my English. Well, folks, neither did I. J.B., in his article called Three Ways Christians Compromise with Sin, said this, quote, Many of us Christians are playing the dangerous game of compromising with sin. Now, do you see the potential idiom in here? Playing the dangerous game. You see, J.B. is on to something. Uh, we know that even the most seasoned Christian is liable to sin from time to time. We also know that God's grace was given to us with the power of the Holy Spirit to say no to sin. So there, there, this is where the problem uh, lies, according to J.B. For J.B. said, quote, The problem is many of us just don't say no to sin. You see, J.B. wants us as readers to understand that compromise in the area of sin is deadly or to use the idiom we are playing with fire. Another author, Robbie, Robbie Castleman, in his article wants Christians uh, to know who we are. Now I can only uh, share a few of his comments but this is what he concludes about who we are as Christians. Robbie said, quote, we are sinful sinners saved by an awesome Savior. We need to be sinners who don't pretend we aren't capable of the worst. We are the worst of sinners in whom God has begun a good work. Well, please turn into your, to your Bibles to um, Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel, chapter 15. And we're going to be in verse 1 through to 20. Mark 15 verse 1 through to 20. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests 
held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked them, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priest, priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was, pardon me, amazed. Verse 6. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. Verse 12. And Pilate again said to them, that, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, scourged, scourged Jesus, pardon me, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put on his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, as we spend some time now looking at uh, Mark's uh, account of Jesus before Pontius Pilate, we want to be reminded today, especially as we prepare our own minds and hearts uh, for this Easter season, the accumulation of it coming up here on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Help us, Lord, not to rush too fast to the resurrection. It is a joyous time. It is a wonderful thing to know. But let us spend some time and consider all that Jesus went through, all that Jesus endured, all that Jesus had to do so that we could be free of our sin, that we could not be held accountable, that we would be able to be in communication with, in relationship with God through Christ. Help us to remember these things, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today on Palm Sunday, churches around the world will gather and celebrate, celebrating the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem one week before his resurrection. But for our purposes today, uh, we are going to fast forward to the events leading up to the crucifixion on Good Friday. Specifically, the context we just have read together here in Mark 15, verse 1 to 20. So Mark gives us an account of Jesus' trial before the Roman governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. We also know that Matthew, Luke, and, and John also include this event in their Gospels. And I would encourage you in your preparation for Good Friday and Easter Sunday that you would take the time to read through each of the Gospel accounts uh, concerning the events leading up to Jesus' resurrection. And uh, this will go a long way in helping us to understand the amazing grace and love of God, who, as the Apostle Paul put it, shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But now let's take a, a moment or two and go into the Old Testament and go to uh, Jeremiah the prophet. Consider with me Jeremiah the prophet who was called by God during the final days of the nation of Judah, Judah and the captivity of Jerusalem into Babylon. In chapter 1 of Jeremiah, we find that uh, God had commissioned him had, as a prophet uh, to bring a message of judgment upon Judah. God said, I will declare my judgments against them, that is Judah, 
for all their evil in forsaking me. They have made offering to other, offerings to other gods and worship the works of their own hands. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 16. So Jeremiah the prophet was instructed by God to go to Judah, to dress yourself for work, arise and say to them everything that I command you. And knowing that Judah, that Jeremiah, pardon me, would uh, be persecuted for, for this message, God said to Jeremiah, they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, declares Yahweh, to deliver you. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 19. We want to fast forward to chapter 13, where we find the events there recorded for us surrounding Jeremiah's encounter with King Zedekiah. He was the puppet king of Israel. He was placed on the throne of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And the long and the, long and the short of it, folks, is the king and his people had trusted the false prophets who had prophesied that the king of Babylon would not come up against Jerusalem. But Jeremiah was sent by God and he prophesied what God had told him to say. The Babylonians would capture the city, burn it to the ground, destroy the temple. And for this message, for this message, Jeremiah was falsely accused. Uh, he was also accused of des uh, des desertion to the Babylonians. And we hear that the officials were enraged at Jeremiah. They beat him and imprisoned him. Jeremiah 37, 15. They imprisoned Jeremiah for the message. There Jeremiah remained, according to the text, for many days. Eventually the king had him removed from prison, but he put him under house arrest. But this did not deter Jeremiah as he would continue to say to the people, Thus says the Lord, He who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence, but he who goes out to the Chaldeans shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war and live. This city shall surely be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and be taken. Jeremiah chapter 38 verses 2 and 3. Again, the response to this message was to deny Jeremiah, deny his message, and accuse him falsely. And this time, according to this chapter 38, they put him down into a cistern where there was no water in the cistern, but only mud, and Jeremiah sank into the mud. Jeremiah 38, 6. You see, Jeremiah was not very popular. But Jeremiah was rescued from the cistern and he continued there to warn the king of Jerusalem all the while under house arrest until the very day Jerusalem was taken by Babylon as God had promised. And the, and, and the, the Jewish, the Israelites were sent into captivity for 70 years. Well, we look at our text for today. Here we find that the chief priests, along with the elders and scribes and the whole council, had bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him to Pilate. This is the very first verse here in Mark 15. But let's just back up a few hours uh, uh, to the time where Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, had made his deal with the chief priest to betray Jesus for pennies on the dollar. The place is the garden. The place is called Gethsemane. We see Jesus, whose soul as, uh, was, as Mark described here in Mark 14, sorrowful even to death. And we see Jesus praying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Mark 14, verse 32 to 42. And moments after Jesus prayed, Judas along with soldiers sent by the chief priests arrested Jesus to bring him before the chief priests and council in that evening. Remember how Jeremiah was treated as a prophet from God? He was ridiculed, falsely accused, and unjustly imprisoned. Then he was placed under strict house arrest and ended up going into exile with many others to Babylon. Why? Why, all this hap Why did this all happen? For bringing a message from God. Jesus was betrayed and then was falsely accused of blasphemy before the chief priest and ruling council of Jerusalem. The trial that he had with the ruling council was a sham. It was an illegal trial under Jewish law, seven ways to Sunday. Please excuse that pun. Let's also remember that the chief priests 
and ruling council had already made up their minds long before this that Jesus needed to be destroyed, to be killed. Why? Why the betrayal, the deceit, the false accusations? For bringing a message from God. Now we know there's more layers to Jesus' story in this particular moment as well. But I want you to consider your own life as a Christian. And consider our brothers and sisters around the world. What Jesus does promise is that we will suffer for bringing the gospel to the culture. That you will be persecuted for bringing a message from God. Just as Jeremiah was, just as Jesus was, and many others since. Apostle Peter reminds us of this when he said in his first letter, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. Let's go back to our text. The chief priest and the council of religious leaders condemned Jesus, and early in the morning brought Jesus to Pilate's headquarters. There in Jerusalem where they accused Jesus before Pilate. The question is, what was Jesus charged with by the religious rulers? Now, I would just say, where do we start? We know that Jesus was accused of many things during his earthly ministries by the Pharisees and usually those in power, the religious leaders. Jesus was accused, remember, of violating the Sabbath law. He was in a synagogue and there was a man there with a withered hand. And Jesus asked some questions about the Sabbath, and he ended up healing that man's withered hand. And the Pharisees then and there decided that Jesus had to be destroyed. We find that, that event in Mark chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. Jesus was accused of practicing sorcery. Practicing sorcery. How? By casting out demons. He was accused of doing that in the power of Satan himself. When Jesus was before the chief priests and scribes and ruling council, they asked him some questions just before they brought him to Pilate. They asked him, if you are the Christ, tell us. We find that found in Luke chapter 22, verse 63. And Jesus responded to that question, if I tell you, you will not believe, and if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Verse 67 and 68 of chapter 22 of Luke's Gospel. The consul then asked him another question. Are you the Son of God then? And Jesus replied, you say that I am. This would have been blasphemous to these Pharisees, saying that he was God. So based on Jesus' reply, the ruling council now before Jesus now, with Jesus before Pilate said to Pilate, he was misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ or the Messiah, a king. Luke 23, 1 and 2. The legal trial, the mocking, the beatings, and the accusations, accusations of treason from the religious rulers of Jerusalem had come to a head as Jesus was presented to Pilate with one outcome expected, only, only one outcome, his death. Folks, when we read a narrative like Mark 15, 1 to 20, we do so with an eye on the context of the Old Testament and New Testament. And the question is, why is this critical for our understanding of this scene between Pilate Jesus and the religious rulers of Jerusalem. Because this one event, my friends, in, in, in human history is more than a fa false accusations of selfish, sinful, powerful men who hoped their plans of killing the rabbi from Nazareth called Jesus would silence his message. But this did not stop Jesus from accomplishing what he had decided, what had been decided in eternity past in the mind of the triune God. My friends, the reality is that the hatred and the mocking, all of it was, pre was prophesied by the Old Testament prophets. And in their spiritual blindness, the, the ruling council missed who Jesus is standing before Pilate at this very precise moment in redemptive history. Isaiah writes of 
four servant songs. And when we read the Old Testament, much of what is written in there from the, from the prophetic angle, from the or prophetic uh, words of the prophets, is also pointing to the coming Messiah. Isaiah, for example, in chapter 42 said this of Jesus, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud, excuse me, and he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the, in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 3. So here was Jesus standing before Pilate as Isaiah had prophesied 700 years before. Here was Jesus standing as Isaiah said, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Isaiah 53, 3. You know, now we can go right back to our text and we can go directly to verse 15. The decision of what to do with Jesus had been made. There would be no turning back for Pilate, no turning back for the Romans, nor for the Jewish audience. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Verse 15. You see, friends, at the precise time in human history, the redemptive purposes and plans of a sovereign God will be fulfilled on a Roman cross, where Jesus took the punishment that you and me deserved for our sin. Did you hear that? You know, as you read through the gospel accounts in your Easter preparation, you will find that Jesus did not deserve to die, but that he willingly took our place on that cross. Peter reminds us of this in his first letter, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us back to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. 1 Peter chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 18. So according to Mark's gospel, he was taken away, and the Roman soldiers clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. Mark 15, verse 16 to 20. Jesus crucified, as one commentator put it so very well, quote, the innocent for the guilty, the perfect for the corrupt. Remember when we started what J.B. wanted his readers to know? Quote, the problem is many of us just don't say no to sin. So let me ask you this question. What is the biblical definition of sin? Can you articulate a concise definition of the doctrine of sin as revealed and taught in the pages of God's Word? I hope you really get a sense of the importance of this subject today in respect to our own personal relationship to God, in respect to our relationship with each other, and as we engage our culture as the body of Christ. Friends, the Bible describes the sin as a transgression of the law of God. John calls this, John put it this way in his first letter, pardon me, sin is lawlessness, 1 John 3, 4. Friends, biblically, sin is rebellion against a holy and just God. Moses reminded Israel of their rebellion when he said to them, you have been rebellious against Yahweh, Deuteronomy 9, 7. We go to Genesis, 30, Genesis 3, the beginning of beginnings, and it describes Adam and Eve's rebellion against God and his commands. And from that day on, my friends, from that day on, sin has been passed through generation after generation of humanity. And all, all who have been born since Adam have inherited this sin. Paul puts it this way, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. So we, my friends, are all sinners by nature. That is, sin has been imputed to each of us because of Adam's sin. We are sinners by nature, and now we are also sinners by thought 
word and deed. In other words, we personally commit sin. Every human being alive today commits sin. Every human being. Every human being alive today breaks the commands of God. Every human being alive today has the capacity and even the willingness to rebel against God. My friends, it's our nature. It's what we are. This brings us to a really, really important question. What is the penalty for your sin and my sin? Well, friends, the only just penalty that God can administer for sin is death. Paul said, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 6.23. And my friends, the consequence is not only a physical death, but also an eternal death, a spiritual eternal death. John was given a, a picture of this in the book of Revelation, which he wrote. And John said, Then I saw a great white throne, and him, and him who was seated on it, I saw the dead and the great and the small standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And if anyone's name was not in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15. Well, with this all in mind, consider again Rob, Robbie Castleman's observations of how Christians deal with sin today. Of course, this is his personal opinion and observation, yet it should uh, encourage us to check our own understanding and knowledge of sin, biblically speaking as well, too, and how we deal with sin in our lives, sin in the church, and sin in the culture. It was Robbie's observation that some Christians, when summarizing salvation, the typical response was, Jesus saved me from my sins, which is true. But their sins were often summarized as things they have done wrong. And they're so glad they're saved from their sins. So glad so much that they would look at really bad people because there are really bad people compared to them on the news or the social media and think to themselves, how can someone do something like that? I can't even imagine it. And this is a problem for Robbie. And it should be a problem for you and me because he asks the right question. Quote, why can't we imagine ourselves as equally rotten, as just as sinful? Now, Robbie, in his article, gives a balanced biblical view of sin and its impact on our lives today as Christians. And I think Robbie is right on many ways and many fronts. Because the problem is this, whether we recognize it or not, is that we often think too highly of ourselves. We often think too highly of ourselves. We don't know who we really are in light of the Word of God. The Apostle Paul warned the Roman church about this. He said to them, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. This brings us to another question. What are we to do then? Well, think about what Jesus did on the cross on Good Friday. John's Gospel puts it this way. John, knowing all was finished, said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. John 19, 30. And our inherited, our imputed, and our personal sin have all been crucified according to the riches of Christ's grace. Paul puts it this way. In him, that is Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, 7. Can I ask you, have you received the forgiveness of your sin? Have you received Christ? Let us pray. Lord, thank you. Praise you, Lord. Oh, help us to have a right, right attitude towards sin. Help us not to play with fire. Help us, Lord, to be as you called us to be as a church, holy as you are holy. Yes, we will sin. We are liable to sin, all of us. The young in Christ and the old in Christ, the immature, the mature, everyone sins. But thanks be to God that you and your mercy sent your one and only Son into the world who would live a sinless life, a perfect life, who would fulfill perfectly the law and the prophets and every single thing. 
and would go to her cross as the Lamb of God, spotless, and take upon himself the sin of the world, my sin, all our sin, once for all, and give to us his righteousness. Help us, Lord, to remember this this Easter, all that Jesus did and all that he experienced and all that he went, and that we know we have someone who is sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for us that knows our lives so very well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you have a good week. Shalom.